and welcome to a second glance where we take a review of what's happening here in Hawaii in this particular program, a review of what's new in Hawaiian sovereignty. This is sort of an update and a collection of what are the issues that now address us as we address the subject of Hawaiian sovereignty. And what I will do is not go into the historical elements and, well, not too far into the historical elements, but start out with what's happening, what's, what has happened in the 1990s and from there move on with some clarifying remarks about the difference between Native Hawaiian rights and Hawaiian national rights and why this dichotomy has caused a lot of confusion in many people's minds. We will also talk about the integrationist approach, the Akaka Bill, the independence model, and how we have this, what we call this Hakaka, or this uh, difference between these two models, and how we can bring it together uh, and unite the efforts of, of the people. <coughs> the issue of Hawaiian sovereignty came about well, it's always been in Hawaii since the overthrow of Queen Liliokani when the United States participated in this conspiracy to uh, change the regime in Hawaii, one that was favorable to the United States and in fact to incorporate Hawaii into the United States. It f had a rebirth of this idea of Hawaiian sovereignty in about the 1970s uh, through the activism of many uh, people involved in, in the farmers movement, uh, the Kahana Valley issue, the Protect Kaho'olawe Ohana, the uh, ethnic studies uh, battles at the University of Hawaii. In the meantime, other issues were still going on. The challenge in the Vietnam War in the United States, there was uh, issues of uh, civil rights and human rights. And uh, Dr. Martin Luther King leading his charge. You also had the American Indian Movement uh, aim uh, starting up and creating some dissension within the United States, asking about indigenous peoples or the First Nations peoples. So it was within this context that Native Hawaiians also started looking at the Hawaii situation. It started more as a cultural issue and with some aspects of uh, spirituality and sacredness of land. And then uh, as we did further research, we took a look at what was in our history and the illegality of the overthrow. For many of us, we had not even known about the overthrow. For myself, I got that information from uh, Queen Lili Okalani, and it was in her book in which she spoke to me and spoke to many other people with regards to what had happened in Hawaii. <clears throat> and so you had this uprising of this Hawaiian spirit questioning the legality. We went into courts, and I've uh, been in and out of the courts using that as a forum. I've also done some work at the United Nations advocating on these issues and trying to bring out awareness. So in the international arena, in the local arena, in the streets, in the movements, issues of Hawaiian sovereignty and the illegalities of the occurrence in our history. And the fact that Hawaii now sat on this heap of illegality and how were uh, the legislators going to comport with that history and what they're trying to do with, for example, the stolen lands, they call it the ceded lands and issues such as that. <clears throat> in the United States, in the meantime, finally we were able to get the ear of the two senators who are still in the Senate, and that is uh, of uh, Senator Inouye and Senator Akaka. Uh, and as a result of that, as, as well as support from uh, the representatives uh, in, in the House side, you had an apology or a confession to the events that occurred and the United States culpability 
in that uh, occurrence as well as the state legislature also adopted a resolution essentially confessing to the illegalities of the United States. Another thing that occurred was uh, the formation of an organization that many people said could never come about, and that is because the Hawaiians could never get together. So this language of dissension and division uh, proved many people wrong, and you formed an organization known as Hui Na'awao. Hui is a, uh, a grouping or a gathering uh, or coming together, and Na'awao was of wisdom, of, of thoughtfulness, uh, things like that. So Hui Na'awao was formed in 1991 among uh, many different organizations that dealt with the issue of Hawaiian sovereignty or the issues of Hawaiian land. Uh, and in coming together, we agreed that we would uh, essentially be an educational organization, not taking sides of one particular organization or another, because among the organizations there were disagreements as to how to exercise what our rights should be or are recognized at the present time. And so with the agreement that we would be merely an educational program, we went out and tried to educate as many people as possible, including the state legislature. In 1992, the state legislature says, <clears throat> you know, the issue of Hawaiian sovereignty is so vibrant at this time that we would like to form a special uh, council. And so they formed a sovereignty advisory council to advise the legislature on how to deal with this subject. I sat on both Hui Nawao as well as a sovereignty advisory council along with, I think there were nine of us on that council. And uh, what we essentially said to the legislature is that the United States is a delinquent in international law, a violator of international law, and these are issues that needed to be addressed. We had some people in the legislature at that time uh, in positions of power, chairman of the Senate uh, Hawaiian Affairs Committee, who refused to accept the report and uh, so the report laid on the side and the Sovereignty Advisory Council, what was called SAC, was sacked. <laughs> they then formed another organization. They said, well, rather than nine people appointed by the legislature, what we will do is form a larger organization, more representative of the voices of the people. And we will select four organizations selected by the legislature, incorporated into the legislation, and we will allow other Hawaiian organizations to nominate other uh, members of this council. And we'll let the governor, the Hawaiian governor, John Waihe, pick and choose who among these nominated he wants to sit on this council. So everyone agreed to it. 21 people were uh, eventually appointed to the council. Uh, I had been uh, chosen as one uh, to be so appointed. It was called the Hawaiian Sovereignty Advisory Council, and we were to advise the state legislature on how to proceed in addressing the issue of sovereignty. Our report to the legislature was this that we have not been elected by the people themselves. We were appointed by the legislature, and the legislature, if it is indeed an instrument of colonialism, then we would simply be responding to a colonial entity. But if we went to the people and consulted with the people, and based on that consultation, then reported to the legislature, then we would be merely the instrument by which the voices of the people could be carried forward. The legislature agreed and said yes, and so we conducted, I think about a year, maybe over longer than that. We went to every major Hawaiian community that we could identify, and we asked the people, how do we deal with the subject of illegalities that occurred in the past? What do we mean by Hawaiian sovereignty? Uh, and, you know, we have one group and another group and different, uh, they call themselves nations or governments or uh, the Republic, and you have Kamehameha, the uh, sixth or seventh, and you have a Lilio Kalani, or you have uh, Pu'ohonua, or you have a Kiaina, and you have people making these representations in the international community as well. And yet, there has been no public 
agreement as to who represents and who speaks for the Hawaiian nation. How are we going to organize this mass of disagreements? And so the general consensus was, well, let us take a vote on electing our delegates to a convention and let the Hawaiian delegates, so elected by the people, sit and propose a governing document or a solution on how we are to proceed with Hawaiian sovereignty. So what we did, we reported to the legislature. The legislature says, well, why don't we create a Hawaiian Sovereignty Elections Commission to handle this process of elections? And rather than going out and making new appointments, all of you are appointed to uh, conduct this election process. So what happened was that we asked two questions. The first question, and this was at different times, the first question, should we elect delegates to propose a Native Hawaiian convention or Native Hawaiian uh, form of governance? If the answer is yes, the next step will be an election of delegates from the different uh, communities. If the answer is no, we drop the whole ball of wax at that point. We took that vote and the answer was overwhelmingly yes. We do want to elect delegates of our own choosing and have them make the proposal. So we followed with a second election and which was for every community, every ahupua'a to elect your own representative. I was elected from the ahupua'a of Lualuale. There was others from Nanakuli, Makaha, Waianae, and from throughout Hawaii Islands as well as from America. We had, I think, four people elected because we have such a large contingency in America. And we all sat in, um, I, let me see if I can find the date. Uh, in 1999, we began our deliberations. At the time, the people who came into this Native Hawaiian Convention uh, were people who were very strongly aligned with the United States government. You had on the other side people who were directly opposed to the continuing colonization of Hawaii, and I stood on that other side and insisted that what we should have is instead Hawaiian independence. We didn't want to be part of the United States. We want an independent nation as we had been prior to the American invasion. So what it showed was that there was a wide uh, range of opinions. And so to present a singular document or options it was going to be a very interesting uh, process that we worked through. What we did was we began our own research on the history. We reviewed international law. We uh, took a look at the, all of the areas. What constitutes a nation? What are the principal uh, factors? One, you need a very definite group of people. You need a specifically identified territory. Uh, you need a governing power that has control and could represent the people as well as uh, protect the people themselves. So you needed these three elements to be recognized in the international community as a nation. So we divided into committees and there were study groups. I chaired the international relations uh, group uh, within the Native Hawaiian Convention. Over a period of time, the convention decided, you know, we have two opposing views. Let us agree to do this. We'll come out with an integrationist approach, very similar to what then became the Akaka Bill. And we'll also come out with an independence approach. Okay. And this is based on what international law essentially says, that the people on the non -self or in non-self-governing territories have the right to choose either integration, a free association, or independence. No one really supported the free association approach. And what we said was that in order to be truly freely associated, one needs to walk through the door of independence and at that time decide whether or not they wanted to associate with the United States or any other country. Otherwise, there's no free association. That association is based on some control by the colonial country. So what we said was we'll come out with two separate 
approaches. And we began writing a document to be essentially the constitutional format of the independent nation. We wrote a document to be the constitutional format of the independent nation. If you want to see these documents, you can go to the website hawaiianperspectives.org and there uh, look for the Native Hawaiian Convention and just do a search for these uh, documents. As we continue to progress in these meetings, we finally decided that, uh, oh, we took a straw vote, and the straw vote among the delegates, uh, where is your general persuasion, towards uh, integration or independence? And very interestingly, because I think if the straw vote was taken at the beginning of our work, it would be a lack of consensus on either side because there were people who were simply uncertain. In this case, the majority said that we support independence, but we were still willing to provide the people with two choices uh, rather than just being pushed on them, the independence approach. We were funded by the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. We were funded by the state legislature. Because there was this promise, essentially, that <clears throat> through this process we would determine how the Native Hawaiians wanted to exercise their self-determination. After that straw vote and when people started, I guess, seeing the movement as an independence movement, and in the meantime you had something else that came out of the U.S. Congress, and that was a Kaka bill talking about an integrationist approach. Well, we found that monies and support from the Office of Hawaiian Affairs coincidentally dried up to the Hawaiian Convention. We found that the money from the state legislature uh, coincidentally dried up uh, as we applied to the state legislature. Uh, one of the senators who was head of the Committee on Hawaiian Affairs refused to even consider uh, the proposal that we had. So the people within these establishments withdrew their continuing financial support, which meant essentially that we were not able to meet on a regular basis. I had been uh, elected as the chairperson of the Native Hawaiian Convention. And so we have been trying to at least maintain and not conclude the convention, what is called sign die or adjourn it and uh, shut down the convention but we have maintained the continuing existence of the convention and try to continue with the production of the documents and at least present it to the Hawaiian people. More recently, in the last legislature, the Senate and the House decided, after long debate and my opposition to it, that they would do two, two things with regards to Hawaiian affairs. The first was to recognize the native Hawaiians as the first people or the indigenous people of Hawaii. I had no objection with that. I didn't think it was necessary, but it's not going to hurt. So I went along with it not speaking against uh, that proposal. The second was that the state legislature would create a new entity consisting of five individuals to essentially begin the process that the Akaka bill would have begun, but this would be on a state basis, where the governor would appoint five individuals, and these individuals will determine who is an eligible Hawaiian. To be an eligible Hawaiian, you need to trace your ancestry back to uh, 1893. You need to have been active in the social involvement, in the civil involvement of Hawaii. I don't know what that means. And in one of my remarks, I said, I don't dance the hula. I don't sing in choral groups. Uh, I'm not an active member of uh, Hawaiian civic clubs. Does that make me a non-Hawaiian? Because that seems to be what they had called for. They weren't sure exactly what it meant. What they did was they passed this law in which the Office of Hawaiian Affairs would fund this entity. Uh, the governor would appoint five people and they would start now a new process, tracking the Akaka bill so that they can create a Hawaiian entity 
to propose, I guess, to the Hawaiian people to see if the Hawaiian people will ratify it and then hopefully convince the U.S. Congress that this is the new Hawaiian sovereign entity. What I have been saying is that what happened to a promise that had been made as early as 10 years ago, as early as 1995, 96, when we went out to the people and we said, if you create this entity, then let us use this entity to carry us into what our expression of Hawaiian sovereignty is. Because you don't like, and I'm speaking to the legislators, and I would speak to the governor as well, because you don't like the direction that you're seeing, and yet you talk about and you praise the idea of self-determination, where a people are able to exercise their own will, now you're going to cut and run, now you're going to create another entity that you hope will be satisfactory to the direction you want to go to. Okay. So today, in these very days, you will hear of the governor's appointment of five people to sit on this new entity, this new structure, and not saying anything about the existing Native Hawaiian Convention. Okay. So that causes me some concern but I'm saying, well, there's nothing we can do except to continue the work of the Native Hawaiian Convention, continue developing our independence proposal, continue developing our integrationist proposal, and find a time, find the money to call together our delegates to review both proposals, submit it to the people, and close our convention. At least we will have done our work. Some of the issues that come out in this question of Hawaiian sovereignty is, one, who is a Hawaiian? And two, how does one choose uh, to select the direction of Hawaiian sovereignty? And in addressing that issue, I oftentimes talk about the issue of self-determination. Who is a self and what are the choices? Okay. When we talk about the people of Hawaii as merely the indigenous people, not as a nation, not as a nationality, but merely uh, a racial group or an ancestral group, then we deal with them as indigenous people. The United States loves to deal with people as Indians, First Nations, or indigenous people because they have that experience as they have swept across the American continent and treated them as subservient to the United States. In the Hawaii experience, we were not merely uh, indigenous people of the land. We were a nation. We were recognized in the international community as a sovereign, independent nation with treaties and executive agreements with the United States and many other countries. So to treat the native Hawaiians, or to treat the issue of sovereignty as merely an indigenous people is not keeping faith with the history, is not being true to the history. So rather than the issue of indigenous people, what we should be addressing is the issue of nationality. We were Hawaiians not merely because we were indigenous, but we were also Hawaiians because many of the people who came into Hawaii and chose to dedicate their loyalty and allegiance to the Hawaiian king. They could have been Caucasians, they could have been Japanese, they could have, and they were Caucasians, Japanese, Chinese, Filipinos, uh, people of many different races, uh, Africans and uh, a lot of Pacific Islanders who were Hawaiian citizens. They were Hawaiians because that was their nationality. So part of the question that we try to address is to what extent are we able to slice away the non-indigenous Hawaiians from this entity. In the independence model, we are saying we're going to take two steps. First, let's let the indigenous Hawaiians decide what is the model they would like to have as an independent nation. The choice we have made is we have to be a multiracial, multi, uh, multi-religious uh, nation. And so we need to incorporate as another step to invite the non-indigenous people who also commit themselves to being Hawaiian to participate in their own election of delegates and let us meet together and let us form a common bond of nationhood. Okay. 
With regards to the integrationist approach in which the United States looks at its indigenous people, now in that case it's dealing specifically with indigenous people. It doesn't want to deal with the issue of nationality. It doesn't want to deal with the issue of nationalism, the issue of independence. So if it is just an integrationist approach, then we'll deal only with the native Hawaiian people, which is what the current bill calls for, the appointment and creation of this native Hawaiian entity. The controversy has been in the Akaka bill, which is essentially the integrationist approach. How do you stand? Do you want integration or do you want Hawaiian independence? When I am faced with that, and I, I'm going to try to, I'm going to advocate within the Hawaiian Convention the following. Let us not divide ourselves with the wrong use of the English language. We are misusing the conjunction or. We say choose either the Akaka Bill approach, the integrationist approach, or the independence approach, as if that is to test our loyalty. The conjunction is wrong. The conjunction should be and. You can choose an integrationist approach as long as we are under the arm or under the footprint of the colonizer, and you can also support independence. And that is a reality that the large extent our Hawaiian people face. Why should a person who is, whose children are attending Kamehameha schools, why should a person who has a home on the Hawaiian Homestead Program, why should a beneficiary of the Lilio Kalani Trust and of all of these programs say, I don't want to be protected by these programs and I choose Hawaiian sovereignty? No, they're not going to say that. And that's not an appropriate choice that they are to be given. Nor are they to be given the choice of uh, only the integrationist approach and leave out Hawaiian sovereignty. The vast majority of the people say, I am a Hawaiian. I want to preserve all of these rights that we have accumulated, we have fought for, we have gone and entered the political arena, but I will not give up my right to be an independent nation and I will not sell that right that my children also deserve to inherit. And that's why the conjunction is very important. The way we use the language, the way we frame the analysis is very important. The choices should be and rather than or. You can choose to support an integrationist approach or not, and you can choose to support an independence approach or not. But it has it cannot be pitted one against the other. If we do, we will continue to fight among ourselves and not draw our forces together. And that is where we need to be going in the issue of Hawaiian sovereignty. My time's up, and I want to thank you for allowing me into your homes. Aloha Hawaii. Ahoy ho. Fala, fala, anu, nu, me, ka, fa, ka.